that's the thing that people need to realize is that you're not going to, it's not, it, you're going to grow into it. And it's just little baby steps, just one little thing moving the needle forward every single day. Today's guest is a very, very special woman and truly is a woman who most people could look up to and say, I want to be like her. I know that this is true for myself. And Carrie Conley is a person that is not only a vision expert, but is an expert in multiple, multiple areas in life. Her story is one of the most interesting, heart-wrenching, positive, and just convoluted stories that I have personally ever heard. So Carrie, obviously you've attained a large degree of success in your life. And as I mentioned, it was also, a lot of it was hiccups and bumps in the road and times where your world seemed to be collapsing around you. At least from an observer's point of view, that's, that's definitely what my world would be feeling like. Right. So would you be able to take us a little bit through your story and how you got to the position where you are and also some of the battles that you had to overcome? Sure. Well, first, I am honored to be here, Devin. This is just a thrill. You have no idea. Um, so my story is, is that I grew up, um, you know, like most of us in a, a pretty normal world and went to college, met my husband in high school, and then he and I went to college together. This was the very early 80s, and this is what you did. You went to college to get a degree. Um, in something that looked like the stable job. And when you get out of college, you went to work at the job and you, you pretty much planned that you were going to be at this job forever. You worked your way up the ranks, the whole thing. Uh, my husband did that very, very well. He went into corporate sales and stayed with the same company for over 20 years, was very successful, uh, very respected. I went into um, corporate marketing and advertising and did okay, but changed jobs about every two years because I just couldn't fit the mold of the nine to five. And at one of the jobs that I held, I met a woman who came to speak. She was kind of like one of those outside speakers you bring in for staff development day. And I don't remember what she talked about, Devin. All I remember is watching her and being so inspired by her that I remember thinking to myself, wow, I would love to, to do that. So I asked her to be my first mentor and she and I went to lunch and I told her, I said, I just can't seem to fit this whole nine to five thing. I think I'm meant for something different. And she was the first person in my life who said, you know what you need to do? You need to get a book. She recommended the book, uh, how, to how to get control of your time in life. And I bought the book and with a legal pad of paper, took a day off at work and I wrote out in great detail, Devin, in every area of my life what I wanted my dream life to look like. Literally what kind of relationship I wanted to have with my husband, what kind of things we were spending our time doing, uh, where were we traveling, where were we living. I wrote a lot about the kind of mom I wanted to be. We didn't have our kids yet, but I knew we would have a family. Um, what kind of values I wanted to instill in them, what kind of mom I wanted to be, what kind of relationship I wanted to have with them, et cetera. And a lot of the things I wrote about my career were question marks. I really didn't know. All I knew is that I wanted to be able to stay home and raise my kids when I had them. I also knew that I wanted to make a residual type income. And I wanted to travel a lot. And one of the things that I wrote when I was questioning all the things around my career, career what, was I, what I was going to do, on the last line of one of the pieces of paper, I literally wrote that someday I thought I'd be a speaker on vision and goal setting. That was the first time I have ever had that thought. It just came out of my head and onto paper. So what I believe happened that day, Devin, and what I know now happened is I got so still and so quiet that God and I were collaborating. And I think what was happening is I was starting to get a vision, a realization of what was in store for me. Because what happened that day is it started to unfold. We started having our kids. I got introduced to the industry of network marketing, which was my first entrepreneurial gig. I jumped into that full bore when I was five months pregnant with my daughter and my son was two. And that was my, my ticket home to be with my kids, earn the trips, the, the income and so on. And then eight years ago, I decided when we became empty nesters, my daughter and my son started leaving the house, um, that I wanted to take the curriculum that I had created 
around vision that I had used with all my leaders in my network marketing industry and, and create curriculum outside of that wall. So I started speaking on it. I started training a little handful of people and a little handful became more. And then I started getting asked to speak at, you know, women's luncheons and things like that. And during this time, um, unfortunately what happened in 2016, we lost my husband to suicide. Um, my son at that point had just started his career. He had just graduated from college. Um, so he and I moved to Arizona so he could start his career and my daughter was still in college. And then three years later, I lost my son to suicide in 2017. So we've had quite a bit happen. Now my daughter is 26. She's married and just had a baby on May 1st. So yes, we've been through a lot. And um, the vision for me, even though I've been through a lot, has been my anchor in all the storms of everything I've gone through. And it's one of the reasons I talk about why you need to have a written vision. I know you were asking me earlier about how do you get it out of your head on paper, right? Yeah. Right. And that is something that, like I said, a lot of us have these dreams and aspirations, but actually putting it down on, on a pad and paper, you know, putting that pen in your hand, that is something that especially young generation is missing out on because we have all access to technology, et cetera, et cetera. So how do I not only put it down on, you know, pick up the pen and put it on paper, how do I even start to create the vision in the first place and then put it down on that paper and say, this is my vision? Because I'll give you a, a, for instance, I'm reading Think and Grow Rich right now. First chapter talks about having a burning desire to achieve whatever it is that you desire. want. Right? So how do I create that vision and then write down, write down that burning desire? Because that is something that it's hard for me to even wrap my, my head around at times. Yeah, because nobody teaches it in school. And I know you and I are going to talk a little bit more. We're going to deep dive into that a little bit. But so here's, there, here's an exercise that I came up with, um, with the first handful of people that I coached. And it's become kind of my signature thing. I've now taught it to thousands of people. And it is so simple, a five-year-old can do it, which, which is the whole point, because I do want to teach five-year-olds how to do this, by the way. So when I was coaching, Devin, I had a handful of pe people on a, on a phone call and I said to them, I said, what I want you to draw on a piece of paper is what looks like a funnel, a circle on top. And then you've got the cone underneath, right? And my best friend who was on the other end of the line says to me, well, mine looks like an ice cream cone. And I said, that's even better because who doesn't love ice cream, right? So you draw an ice cream cone, your favorite scoop on top, whatever that looks like. And then your cone underneath, right? So the next thing I get people to do once they've done that is date this at the top as if it's three years from today. So we just fast forward, we put a date as if it's three years from today. And then underneath the date, we put ages. How old will you be on that day? How old will your kids, your grandkids, brothers and sisters, nieces and nephews, any younger people that you're really involved in their life? And then after those ages, we put the ages of anybody older than you, your parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles, right? Here's why we date this. Two reasons, time and aging are non-negotiable. You and I only have 24 hours in the day. We can't change that as humans, correct, right? So we're going to, if you and I agreed to, hey, let's get back together here three years on this date, three years will have passed. And the other thing that will have happened is you and I will be three years older. So here's what happens when I get people to think about ages. When they project out, they start to see some lifestyle shifts coming. Maybe with your age right now, Devin, you're starting to see three years out thinking, okay, so you'll be what, in your mid-20s, right? Yeah, I'll be 25, right? right? Mid-20s. Yep. So at mid-25, you know, at 25, you're starting to think, wow, okay, so what will that look like as an adult? Maybe you're starting to think that you want to seriously date or... Um, you know, buy, buy your own home or, you know, we all can see some things coming that we need to look at and start preparing for today. So for example, Devin, when I started in uh, network marketing and my kids were babies, I was projecting three years out what it would look like when they were three to five years old. And so I started setting goals within my career as to where I wanted to be income wise based on what I knew I was coming. And one of the things I knew that we wanted was to put our kids through a private Christian school, which is super expensive. 
<laughs> so I could then take that three year, your three years, your ice cream scoop, and then I could take it down into the cone part and start breaking it into one year goals, six month goals, and 90 day goals. 90 day goals are magic in, in life. Quarterly, really targeted 90 day goals. And that tells me what I should be doing this month, this week, and literally all the way down to today. So I get people to reverse engineer their life. And most people don't do this. What most people do is jump out of bed with their hair on fire with a long list of to-dos um, that are getting them nowhere, really. I mean, they have no idea why they're doing those things. It's not attached to anything that they're, they're reaching towards further out. Um, so I've done this with a lot of people. And so I get people who will send me pictures of their ice cream cone that they've put up on the wall. They've, you know, I get them to add in the scoop part, all the things they see that they want as if it's three years out. So they write things around their faith life, their family life, their finance and career, their fitness, you know, whatever they see. Well, I think that, I think, so one, one of the things that I live by, um, I have this saying, think macro, act micro. So I think that goes exactly like to what you're going to at its essence, because, you know, three years away seems so unfathomable to most people, but right. that's the, that's the end goal. Like, well, as I was telling you, when I started college, my end goal was to, you know, graduate with this grade point average or, right. you know, to create this or to go on this many mission trips, whatever the case may be. Um, but then once you said you break it down quarterly, yearly, you know, then 90 days and then, okay, now how can I break that down into my daily actionable steps that I'm taking here and now? Because I think, Carrie, maybe you could speak to this in a lot of the work that you've seen. A lot of people just get overwhelmed right. and their minds can't even comprehend them achieving that. So I also am an ultra marathon runner and running like 50 miles, 100 miles is a lot to, for your brain to process. But once I broke it down and said, okay, now I just need to get five more miles so I can get to the next aid station where I'll just get, you know, uh, a candy bar or peanuts or salt in my body, then I'll be okay. And then from there, it's just another five miles, et cetera, et cetera. So right. how have you seen that play out and how important do you think it is to break down big goals that we have into tangible steps that we can take now? Right. It's a really good question because when I get people in a live workshop to literally write out their three-year vision, Devin, first and foremost, they're a, little, they're a little afraid to do it, quite frankly, because, because some of their dreams and goals are so far from the circumstances they are in right now that they can't see how it's even possible. And so most people will not allow themselves to even dream because of wherever they're at right now, whether it's financially or a relationship they're in, or a job that they feel that they can't quit. Um, they just won't allow themselves to think this is possible. And what I get them to really realize is that anything is possible. The first thing you have to do is do what I did and dream big and write out everything you want your life to look like. The how will show up just like it did for me. But the other thing I remind people is it's not gonna happen overnight. It's not like you and I are gonna set this big, vision and tomorrow it's there and you're not prepared for it. It doesn't work that way. God would not do that to you. <laughs> Everything I'm achieving right now and where I'm at right now, it's because I've been, I've been preparing for this for 25 years. And the first baby step for me was to write the vision and get really, really clear on what I wanted so that the opportunity could show up. And it was just a baby step. Right. I, I think that is so important for people to, to realize. So what advice would you give to a young person, you know, a college student that is looking not only to what job they want, but is looking to find themselves? Because a lot of the things that we're talking about as vision is so applicable, but I think it's extra applicable a little bit to college students who are like so lost. What would you tell a young, a young college student? Yeah, I could talk about this topic all day long. And this is where my passion is right now, because because they are lost and it scares me that they're lost and I know why they're lost. And unfortunately we still have a culture that raises up little humans to believe that they have to follow a system 
that may or may not necessarily be, be authentically right for them. They are taught, you are taught from five years old, once you enter school, the way school is right now, that it might be really cute that you're super creative. I grew up wanting to be a singer, Devin. I, I spent my days in my bedroom singing into anything I could make into a microphone. The, but that was not going to be the right path for somebody in the 80s to follow. So it became very, very clear in middle school that I needed to really start thinking about how I was going to get into college. I wasn't a great student either, by the way, um, so that I could get a good job. And that's what we train you up to do right now. And so what I see happening is you go through all these years of your life being told that might be cute that you love to read or you're super artistic or whatever, but that's not going to give you a secure job. So we're going to erase that. And we're going to tell you what the program needs to look like. And so by the time you get out of college and you get your first job, six months into the job, what I see happening for people your age is you get very, very disillusioned about your life. You start looking around going, this is what I've been preparing my whole life for. I hate this job. I don't know why I'm here. I don't know what I'm capable of because nobody's ever said to you, hey, Devin, I want to talk to you about what you really want to do. And that's the problem. So at your age, we have to start talking to college students and, or, and earlier, way earlier, about what is it that is burning in your heart right now that you really want to do. Forget about the money. Forget about the title that you think you need to have, especially for men your age, unfortunately, Devin. Uh, men are really, really groomed up to believe that you're, what you do is, is who you are. And so if you have any kind of career shift or a loss of job or any, anything like that, which is what was happening with my husband, you, you start to really lose your identity. You're so attached to it. And it's so hard for you to even think about being who you really want to be. Right. So Carrie, going, going off of that a little bit, um, talking about I identity, like you were saying, uh, I think that's something else that is, is really, really important as well, because when talking about developing a vision or achieving one's goals, I, I feel like in college, for example, I were to take uh, a 21 credit semester, it's like right. seven classes, which like is mind blowing to most people, yes. but I would do that and I would excel and I would, and I would do very well. And people would be like amazed to a certain point, like, wow, how did you do that? But to me, it was just like, it was another, another semester, another day, because I developed a way in my mind that I attached, you know, excellence with who I was. So that was part of my identity. So whatever it took for me to do, to be proficient or excellent at this task, mm -hmm. I was just going to do it. So for other people, it might look like, it's unreachable or it's like, once again, unfathomable, but since it's part of my identity, I think that's so powerful and going back to vision. So what is the power of writing it down compared to just thinking? Because I think what you maybe, I don't know, just maybe might be getting at is that you really implant that in you the moment that you write it down. Yes. So if you, if you could talk a little bit about the power of specifically writing it down, because I'm curious about that myself. Right. Yes. Okay. So the ice cream cone is just the, the beginning part. The next step that I get people to do when I have a longer day workshop, or I, actually I sometimes do two or two and three day uh, conferences, which I hope someday we get back to, but I miss that is I get them to write a letter and they date the letter again, as if it's three years out and they're writing the letter to somebody as if they have not talked to that person in, in the three years. So for example, Devin, if you and I got off this podcast today and you and I don't talk for three years and three years from today, you decide to sit down and write me a letter and catch me up on your life. So here's the, the rules around the letter. One, you can't leave anything out. The bigger the dream, the better put everything on it and don't leave anything out because you don't feel like it's possible, right? The other thing is it's really important that you choose the right words. One of the reasons we need to get a written vision crystal clear on paper and out of your head, because what's rolling around in your head, most of it is not good. That dream, that big, beautiful dream is being really squelched with a lot of negative self-talk and a lot of doubt and a lot of fear. 
So we need to get it crystal clear onto paper so that you can see it without all of that. And you need to make sure you use the right words. So wishy-washy words are, I'm hoping, I'm trying, we'll see. Um, so when I get people to write the letter, I tell them you need to use words like I've done, I have, we're doing, um, this is what's coming. Because the brain, how the brain works is the brain goes to work at creating whatever you tell it. It's just a machine. It doesn't care. So for many, many years, for example, I told myself I'm bad at math. I'm horrible at math. I will never get math. I will never understand it. And so my brain would hear me say that and go, okay, we're not good at math. And it wasn't until I learned this concept of really being aware of what I was saying when I was talking to myself and getting rid of all of that, I changed that story to, wow, I am really good at math, especially when it's, it's connected to a business plan in dollars. <laughs> I figured out I'm really good with numbers. So do you see what I'm saying is that the magic is in writing it out. Number one, because now you're making a commitment. When people just leave it in their head, they're leaving it in their head because they don't want to be held accountable to it. And so we've got to get it on paper so that A, now we're putting it out into the universe and God saying, I'm ready to collaborate. God starts showing up going, okay, here's what we're going to start doing, baby steps. The other thing, instead of typing it out, I make sure that people write it pen to paper because there is a big connection between writing your hand and your brain, right? So again, the more detailed, the better because whatever you tell the brain, the brain goes to work at making it happen. And so we've got to start collaborating. And that's why we have to get the vision written in as much detail as you can give it. Yeah, and I, I really appreciate you sharing that point um, because it makes me think of something else. And I keep going back to, um, so I have a mentor of mine, Jermaine Miller, uh, a big real estate guy in New York City, but he, a fascinating story. But he basically talks about the law of attraction works both ways. <laughs> so it, while, while it works positively, you're also telling us that it works for the negative as well. Uh, is that something that you see in a lot of clients, the negative self-talk that is holding them back? All day long. <laughs> right, of course. And then, and then uh, I also follow somebody else, uh, a former Navy SEAL. His name is Chad Wright. And one of his big philosophies is the power of the spoken word. Yes. So for example, he just ran uh, something called a last man standing run where you just keep running in circles on this, this loop until there's one person left. And he was in a field with uh, a USA national team member for ultra marathons, super extraordinary guy. And it, there came a point where Chad on one of the later, uh, like 30 hours into the race, he, he hit his toe really, really badly. And one of the people that were observing saw him do it. But when he came back to the start line, his friend asked him, man, how's your toe, how's your toe doing? And he says, he says, brother Mark, we're not even going to talk about that. And he just <laughs> went back out. And then 20 minutes later, he forgot that his foot even hurt him. Yeah. So in your opinion, what is the power of not only the written word, but the spoken word? Well, it's, you know, everything. And I tell everybody that once they write their vision to be super careful with their words. And then the next step I get them to take is to share their vision with somebody else and to share it with somebody safe. And here's what I mean by safe. Unfortunately, a lot of us, a lot of times we want to share our vision with people who aren't visionaries. They're not like you and I that have big dreams and big goals. Um, so you run to that person saying, I want to share this with you. And that person, a lot of times there are people that love you, like family members, parents, spouses, whatever, because they love you, they want to protect you. And so if they see you going after something that you, they can't understand, they will out of love, try and stop you from doing it. And it's, it's, it's heartbreaking and it's where most people stop. So we have to make sure we share the vision with somebody we know we can trust that is going to say, you know what, I totally see this for you. And I want to be the person that on the days you doubt this, I'm going to talk you down from the ledge, right? So I get them to share the vision with somebody else. And then I get them to take one more step. Once they've shared the vision to say to this person, listen, I'm really working on squelching a lot of the fears and the doubts that I have going on that are going to keep me from this vision. So I'm going to allow you to call me out on words that you hear me saying that maybe I'm not aware. Maybe I don't even, maybe I'm not even aware that I've now just said to you 10 times, I'm not good at math. So you get this person to lovingly say, okay, you know what? 
I'm going to be the person that when you say something that maybe you're not aware of with love, I'm going to say, hey, Devin, I don't know if you realize that you just said, I don't think I can about 10 times. As a coach, it's one of the things that people um, hire me to do is they hire me with love to be able to be that person to say, I don't know that you realize that you say this, but I hear you saying that. And I get them to just be aware of it so that they can change it because other people did that for me years ago. It was really eye-opening when I started realizing all the negative stuff I had going on. Just, you just aren't aware until somebody brings it to the surface for you, right? So yeah, we just have to be, because again, the brain goes to work at whatever you tell it. So whatever is coming out of your mouth, the brain goes, okay. So we have to be very, very careful about that. Right. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Carrie. Like you said, it's the brain, I think that's such a fascinating thing you keep saying the brain does whatever you tell it to do. I think not many of us understand that and recognize that. Yep. So going back to uh, creating the vision, writing it down, speaking it into existence, what is the importance of emotions in all of this? Because I think that, for example, um, a lot of people that do meditation yes. or you know, reflect, which I found in my life is phenomenal. A lot of it is about not only you know writing it down, but feeling it, that I am already there. Now I just have to figure out how to get there, like you said, but I feel it in my body, like I'm already a champion, for example. Right. I just gotta get there. So when you get there, it's not like a huge shock, because you already felt that 10 yes. times over. What is the power of emotions? Because that's something that often get, gets left out of the conversation when it comes to goal setting or vision yeah. setting and achievement. Yes both positively and negatively. So what's beautiful about it, having a vision written like this is it becomes your source of motivation and your source of inspiration. Because most of us, especially right now, Devin, the first thoughts that we have when we open our eyes in the morning and start thinking are usually not good. Uh, they're usually around, okay, how am I gonna pay the bills? Or how am I gonna get through this day? How are we, how am I really gonna, you know, get over my fears. It's all this negative talk. And what we think about, we bring about. So you and I are both friends of Dave Meltzer. Dave is huge on this topic. I've learned, so, the man is brilliant. Brilliant when it comes to this and law of attraction. He was my coach and my mentor for a while. And he said something to me, I'll share with you now to this point, Devin. I called him one day and I told him, I said, especially after my husband and my son died, you know, my first thought when I wake up in the morning could be, wow, I can't believe this has happened to me. This is terrible. This is awful. And so that thought can carry me through the rest of the day and drag me down. And I said to Dave, how do you get up over that? And he said, Carrie, the first thought is the only thought of the day. Every other thought is a reaction to that thought. And I thought, oh my God, that is so profound. And it's so true. So we have to make a choice, you've made a choice to focus on what you're excited about in the vision versus what maybe is not good that's going on right now. And that's what people don't know is that you have to not only the feel the positive emotion and follow that through. And yes, meditation, that's become a big part of my life this year. But here's the other thing about emotion. We have to not let it run our day. I heard a, a, a speaker years ago say something that I have never forgotten and I've quoted her many times. She said the biggest, one of the biggest characteristics of being a leader and leading yourself first is learning how to manage emotion. Because most of us are running our lives on negative emotion and we're not able to separate it out and keep going. And obviously now, you know, I've been through a lot in my life and people ask me, you know, how in the world did you pick up and keep going? And the reason I've been able to do that is because my vision and my purpose is bigger than what I've been through. I'm able to put that in its place and understand that it's all just a piece of the puzzle. The reason you could take the school load that you did, Devin, and manage it was because what you wanted was bigger than that school load at the moment. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, it's so true. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. When all of those school those students, your your fellow your fellow classmates around you were going, Devin, this is just impossible. Are you crazy, man? They're just looking at you because they see the impossible that it's too much, it's too hard, and you are just seeing it as one little step towards the bigger vision. Right. Yeah, that's 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 a really 
I, unique, unique way to look at it that I feel like a lot of us, when we're in the moment, it's easy to forget about that. Yes. You know, forget about that mentality because we're all stuck in so much of the noise. But like what you said, with meditation becoming an intricate part of your life or just alone time in general, yes. I think that alone time is, is shamed in our culture because it's like you have to be surrounded by friends. You know, you got to be out yes. and about doing doing X, Y, and Z. But what about, you know, the interaction with yourself? Because yes. I, I, what, I, what I feel is that if you don't interact with you, you're never going to discover who you are and there's never going to be that fulfillment in your life. And I think that you're a testament to that because after all that you've been through, it would have been really easy to go out and, and, and just, you know, try to fabricate relationships to make up for that or whatever that the fact that you lost, but you went, you dealt with it inside of you. And then I, it would be really, really bad for me to say that you found peace, but even speaking to you, you've been able, you know, you're still here spreading a positive message, which to most people is amazing. So what was your self-talk like? during those crises that you went through? Because that's amazing to me that you're still here, this amazing woman that is a role model for us all. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, so many emotions, of course, you go through first and foremost, just absolute grief. Um, when my husband died, there was so much going on in our lives that I didn't have a lot of time to pause. As I mentioned, my son had just been accepted a job in Arizona, so I had to get him here. My daughter was still in college, so I had to get her back to school. And I still had a lot, a lot of clientele in Colorado. So I was spending my life for two years traveling back and forth between Colorado and Arizona every single month. I lived in two places, literally. So there was not a lot of time for me to, uh, and my company, I had just started my speaking company and had just taken off. So I couldn't stop really. When my son died, I took about a year and went a little underground. I did what I had to do to, to maintain my integrity with my clients, but I didn't bring on any new business. And I was kind of, I kind of disappeared for a little while to just really figure out like what that was all about and what I was going to do with that. So yes, like you said, I went, I went inward a lot and quiet time. I say this almost every time I get on social media and every time I speak, my first hour of the day is critical that I'm in quiet time. I have got to get myself in the truth, which for me is reading devotions, journaling, um, praying, um, asking God, you know, what is it you want me to do today? Give me the strength to do it. Um, without that first hour of the day, the rest of the day is wonky, right? Um, I think one of the blessings that's going to come out of whether people see this right now uh, or not with all this quarantining is what you're talking about, Devin, that we have to now be face to face with ourselves. And I used to be an extreme extrovert. And now if I'm with one or two people at a time, it's enough. <laughs> and I crave my quiet time. So I do see that as a positive right now. Carrie, well, I'm just curious, you mentioned journaling a little bit. Do you have a journaling routine that you follow or something that you could share with us to get into journaling? Because I found for myself, it, it's kind of hard, honestly, to remain consistent with it, but I really yeah. want to, but yet it's like, I'll miss a day and then that'll lead to three days. What is, what is your routine like with journaling? Well, I started reading a devotion book. Um, wow, this is well over 10 years ago. I've recommended it to many, many people. Uh, it's called Jesus Calling. Uh, it's a Christian devotional book. Uh, and then there's another one after that one called Jesus Always. And so I have almost daily read that daily devotion. And then I will journal what I hear God saying to me out of what is written. And it's pretty amazing. No matter what book you pick up, if your heart's really in it, the message will be meant just for you that day. It's crazy. It's just what you needed to hear that day. So it has become a habit. I get up, I read that first thing, and then I journal what I hear. Um, and that kind of becomes my mantra for the day, Devin. Whatever I'm hearing that day, if it's a verse or, or a line in a book that I was meant to hear, I, I put it then into my day planner. I have a day planner that I love um, so that I'm reminded that this is what I'm to focus on for the day right? But here's the thing about journaling, just like meditation. If you miss a day, don't beat yourself up. <laughs> you know? um, meditation is hard for me. I'm a doer by nature. I love to get things done. 
So for me to sit and like quiet my mind and breathe for 20 minutes, even five minutes has been um, a real practice for me. And I'm not good at it every day, to be honest with you. But, um, and I also follow Gabby Bernstein. I don't know if you're familiar with Gabby Bernstein. She's a huge spiritual leader and uh, is teaching millions of people how to meditate. And she's the first one to say, don't beat yourself up if you don't get it done. And there's no right or wrong to it. It's a practice like yoga, like anything. Right. Yeah. That's, that's the, that's the biggest thing. And I feel like when I get frustrated sometimes, then it's like, I'm not even going to try it again. Like just like so many other things in life, least, I'm not going to try it again because I'm probably not going to be consistent anyways. Yeah. Um, so then I'm really curious about the impact of faith in your life in general, because as we were talking beforehand, I went to a Catholic university um, and I was a part of a Catholic special program that we had at the university. So I was lucky enough to really develop my relationship with God, Jesus in my case. Um, and really, it really helped fine tune who I am as a person, the type of leadership philosophy, you know, being a servant leader, that's the type of leader I aspire to be going back to how Jesus was and it kept me grounded and it always kept me level headed no matter what the situation was, because I always knew I had something to fall back on no matter whatever happened. And that was my relationship with God. Yes. So for you personally, how has your relationship with, with God impacted, you know, all different areas of your life? Because I don't think there's, there's a black and white. I think they're intertwined with each other. 100%. Yes. Yeah. Well, it in one sentence, it's everything. Um, I would not still be standing without that faith right now, truth. I, I, I don't know how people who go through adversity to the level that I've been through without faith get through life. Um, it, it just has to be so challenging. The pain has got to be enormous. So for me, it's the faith of knowing that there's something better to come. So my mantra this year has become the best is yet to come. It's literally on this plaque right behind me. The best is yet to come. And the reason that is my mantra is because I know it to be true that, you know, this earthly life we're in right now, Devin, blip on a radar screen, right? It's not about today. And it's not about the stuff you and I are achieving. And it's not about this, the accolades and the recognition or whatever. It has nothing to do with other than knowing that there's something better coming. And that's what I hold on to is knowing that uh, no matter what I've been through or going through here, that I have eternity um, that is way better than anything was while I was here. So that's what I attach to. And that's why my daughter and I co-wrote a book together last year. Um, and we titled it, Keep Looking Up. And right. I was going to, I was going to ask you a little bit about that. Can you share with us a little bit about that book? Because I've, I've only heard I personally have not read it yet, but I am going to get a copy. I guarantee you that um, the premise behind the book and what we could take away from the book. Cause I know what it's about, you know, how is it applicable to everybody? Well, we wrote the book for lots of reasons. We knew that there was a purpose for all of this as horrific as it is. And as sad as it is for my daughter and I, there is a purpose in it. And we had to focus on that in order for Laurel and I to heal we had to see the purpose. So the book is all about perspective, really. No matter what adversity you're going through, it doesn't have to be what we've been through, but we all have our stories and stuff we've been through. It's always a matter of perspective. And so Laurel and I have always just wanted to keep looking up beyond what, what our life is here and know what's coming. So we wrote the book um, to heal, to get our story out. But we didn't want to just write, okay, here's our sob story. Here's what happened to us. We wrote the book in 11 chapters of what we learned out of this whole process. So each chapter is my perspective and then hers. So it's both of our voices. And it's us sharing what we learned in the journey. Um, so that people going through their own adversity, no matter what it is, can use that to help them get through their own or you can help a friend or a family member going through adversity because one of the things people don't know what to do, like for us, a lot of people wanted to help us, but they had no idea how to help. And I know it's very frustrating. So the book has become a tool for people who are saying, I know somebody who's going through something really hard and I don't know what to do. We share some stuff in there as to here's, here's what you could do. 
There's questions at the end of every chapter. So you literally can do it like a family discussion or a book club or whatever. But really the end of it is we want to keep pointing people heavenward really is, is the bottom line is we're all just, this is not reality. <laughs> what we're all pointing to is a much better place. And that's what we mean by keep looking up. Yeah, that's what I really love about you in specific, uh, Carrie, is, is your relationship with your faith and how that really drives you. Because in a society that um, constantly is throwing social media at us, I mean, I can't tell you the last, actually, I have one friend who actually posts somewhat frequently about Jesus mm -hmm. or faith in general, but every other thing I see is about some tangible thing that I can hold in my hand right. and that they say, this is success. You know, I see all these promotions on Instagram and so forth, these people with cars and selling me this course because, you know, you can make this amount of money. But for me, it's, it's just, there's no amount of money that I could put on my faith, you know, and, and it's, it's free. But I also heard something, something else that people put value on things that we can get in society, but we don't really put things, we don't put value on things that come for free, like right. our relationships, like, you know, our the, the capabilities that we have with our mind, our relationship with God. It's just crazy how people take things for granted until something happens that makes you put it into perspective, like you were saying. Right. And I, I've had uh, situations in my life where I always share on this podcast, my, my kind of pivotal changing moment was in 2016 when my grandmother just suddenly like had a massive heart attack, healthy woman. And then next day she was like gone. And it was mm -hmm. crazy because I asked her, she asked me if I wanted to sleep over that on that day. And I was like, no, I have to go to my internship the next day. I'll do it next weekend. And then next weekend never came. So it was like, how silly am I to play around with time that I don't know if I or the person to the left or right of me has. And right. then that perspective enables me to look at stressful situations and see that it's not actually stressful. Right. Because now I have the perspective of, okay, losing my grandmother that way, that was stressful. But now school or something that isn't a matter of life and death, it's just a letter grade. It's, right. not, it's not a matter of life and death. Right. Um, so I, I think that's uh, a really great thing that you say about perspective. And I also sense something uh, here, which you didn't even mention it, but I could, I could almost guarantee that this is a practice in your life and it's the importance of gratitude in yes. your life. Um, what is the importance of gratitude for you? Cause for me, it's almost everything being grateful for what I have, but I'm curious to hear from you. What is the importance of gratitude? Well, like faith, it's, it's, it's non-negotiable. I mean, you have to be grateful. And I also journal every day throughout the day and at night, my gratitudes, I'm constantly telling God, thank you for this. Thank you for that. Um, even if it doesn't look like a good thing at the moment, I I've learned to thank him because I'm much older than you, Devin, and I've been through enough in life to know that even in the moment when it looks really bad, it was meant, it's meant for good, even, especially all this stuff we have going on right now. I know most people, the people who are really struggling with what we're going through right now are probably people who haven't been through any kind of adversity yet in their life. So this could be the first. And so it's becoming their, their, their pivotal moment. For you, it was your grandma. For me, it was, of course, losing my husband and my son. So for things like this to happen, for me, it's like, well, okay, it's just one more thing. <laughs> you know? um, I'm not stressed about it. I don't worry about it. It doesn't take me down. I still get up and do what I'm supposed to do every day. And so I just think that we have to, and I said this yesterday on social media, I get on there quite a bit, um, that it's always a matter of perspective. Somebody always has it worse off than you do. And I know that sometimes it sounds like I'm belittling somebody's situation, which could be horrific right now, like mine was, but I can look around and see something that could be 10 times worse. That's I, what gratitude is about. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And the fact about this, now was that, I'm also curious, the development of your, the importance of perspective. Now that wasn't something that you just woke up one day and were like, okay, perspective is so important. That was a gradual process, correct? Yeah, learning from the people who have been my, my mentors for years. I've had hundreds of them. Um, just watching how they conduct themselves and what they talk about, most especially what they don't talk about. 
I said this a couple of days on, on Facebook that I don't carry on a lot of conversations with a lot of people like I used to, Devin, because their conversations to me in about three minutes, I'm like, I'm out because, <laughs> because I, I can relate so much. That's why I, I, I wrote something. Um, I also have a blog that I, I write on sometimes. Um, and one of the things that I talk about is that, especially in college, if you can't surround yourself with people who have the same focus or the same drive, it's better off, honestly, to be in solitude because then you're going to go down to the same level as them. Yes. Unless you can find that core group of people who have the same drive and focus as you. But like what you're saying, it is hard to have a conversation because it seems like people's focus are in such a different place than yours. And I don't know if that's your experience, but it, that's my experience. It's 3000% my experience and it's got to be 10 times harder for you because of your generation and what you were saying earlier of you being, you, you being taught that you should be around a lot of people all the time and be in all these groups and all this stuff, which I did all of that. Um, but it's, it's hard if you don't find the right people and it's a small percentage you and I, the visionaries, the people that want to live out our purpose and carry it out, it's about 2%, Devin. It's a really small number. But if you can find just a handful of those people, you are really blessed and rich. And I would rather have one or two of those people than a hundred people that I just, I, I can't even get into the conversation. It's just so like, I just can't do it. I'd rather be by myself. Um, but it's, it's crucial that you be, so I've taught something to thousands of people. If we have time, I'll do it now because it's been a game changer. I want you to pretend that you're standing on a theater and you're looking out into the seats and there's rows of seats. And let's say there's five seats in every row. The next thing I want you to do is I want you to imagine the five people that you spend the most amount of time with every week. And with each person, I want you to rank them based on how they make you feel. Not as a person, this isn't a judgment as a, as a person, but how do they make you feel when you're with them? The ones and two, I'm sorry, the nines and tens, of course, are gonna be the people that just lift you up, just fill you up, inspire you, motivate you. They believe in you. They are seeing your vision. They're encouraging you to go after it all the time. Obviously on the opposite end of the scale are gonna be the ones and twos. And these are the people that no matter how high you're feeling, two minutes with them and they have sucked the life out of you, right? Um, the middle numbers are people that maybe you're your acquaintances with them. You have great banter, but there's no ups or downs, right? Now, here's the key. The only people who should be in the front row of your life should be the nines and tens. These are the only people who get access to your thoughts, your time, your emotion. You only allow those people to give you advice and to take it. Anybody below a nine or 10 needs to be moved out of the front row of your life. And for most people, when I do this exercise, it's very eye-opening for them because they start seeing the people that they are allowing to speak into them. And sometimes these are people they're blood related or married to. It's really hard are getting too much access to their time and their emotion and they need to be moved. So Carrie, I, I was curious. So, in a, in a world that, where negative thoughts, behaviors are not encouraged, but are just constantly circulated. And that's, like you said, there's more people wake up with a negative thought than a positive thought. Right. So how do I, I'm not talking so much about visualization, but just changing like the mindset in general, you know, right. how do I change from being a negative person to a positive person? Because mm -hmm. a lot of us do it subconsciously without even noticing. That's well, the crazy part about it. But once you become cognizant of it, you know, what are you, what, in your opinion, what are some steps that one can take to turn that around? Yeah. So first is awareness, like me and you. Um, for me, it was awareness thing of, wow, I had no idea what my self-talk was like. It was horrible. And so that was the first thing, awareness. Number two, you got to want to change it. I wanted to change it really bad. I see a lot of people who become aware, but don't necessarily want to change it so much which tells me they don't have a big vision for their life, right? They're okay with being okay and negative and staying there. The next step after wanting it is teaching yourself how to change it. You can change the self-talk. It takes a lot of work, but you can do it. So that comes down to, again, what are you reading? What are you listening to? What are you watching? Who are you hanging with? 
what are you doing every day to take those little baby steps? I mean, it's a, it is a work in progress, but the good news about how the brain works is that you can totally rewire it. If you start telling it different messages, eventually the old messages start fading away because the brain break de- breaks down and rebuilds, breaks down and rebuilds. So the good news is you can get to a point in your life like I am now where some of the negative thoughts and self-doubt and fears I used to have just don't even exist anymore. Right now, now that's also not to say that you don't have those moments where those things creep back in, you know, and you're, and you're not superwoman and th- that never happens. No. Right. Doesn't. Of course, of course, because it still exists, but you've developed a mindset where there's more positive thoughts than I would assume are negative thoughts. I just and- have a different relationship with them now. Mm. So I still have fears because okay. I do believe fear comes with growth. So if if you don't have any fear in your life whatsoever, that means you're super comfortable. So fear is a good thing because it means you're growing. But the difference with fear is that I've learned to look at it and go, you know what? That means I'm, I'm doing, doing good. I'm going in the right direction. And I just invite fear along to watch me work instead of let me shut me down. Let it shut me down, right? I've just put a different relationship around it. Right. Oh, thank you for that because I think – that's a that's something I never thought about the relationship behind it. Not that you don't have them, but just changing the relationship. Um, just one of, one of the the last things that I want to close on. Um, so I was just curious quickly. Do do you util, utilize the words dream, visual, um, vision, and goal? Are those interchangeable, or are there diff, or is, is it different things that we're talking about? Because that's something that I I like. We always hear visions, goals, and dreams. But yeah. is there really a differentiation between the three or what do you think? Yeah. So I know a lot of dreamers. Dreamers are people that talk about all the things that they some, someday will do, but won't take the action. You probably know some of those people too. And so the step beyond dreaming is to be a visionary. So a visionary is somebody who will take the action and actually say, okay, I'm going to write this down. I want to see it come to fruition. So the first step is I'm going to take it out of my someday dreaming, hoping, wishing, praying into I'm going to write it out, write my vision so that I can now see it and focus on it, start teaching my brain. Goals are the thing that come after the vision. Remember when I said you've got the three-year vision and now you break it down into one-year goals, six months and so on. So goals for me are the acts, uh, the, the action steps in the right timeline that are getting me towards the vision, which fulfills the dream that I have for my life. Yeah. Oh, that, that breaks it down quite perfectly for me because <laughs> we're always, like you said, it's, it's, I could ask so many questions because we're not taught it in, in class, um, but you know, th- to me, this is more important than learning Excel or yeah, learning how to yeah. use Microsoft office because, you yeah. know, I can always go out and learn that in my a job or whatever the case may be. But this you can't, you can't, you could learn it, but it's a lot less accessible because it's not talked about as much. Although, you know, YouTube and podcasts do make it accessible at this point, but I, I love, love what you said. And the last thing that I, I want to hear is what is the legacy that you hope to leave behind? You know, truly, I really am on a mission, which is why I'm so honored to do this uh, podcast with you, Devin, and, and the age group that you reach out to is because right now, to this point, I've been working with mostly adults. Um, and adults meaning adults, you know, around my age, okay? People who have already established their life and their career, raised their families, whatever. I still want to work with those people because it's important that they follow out their vision and purpose no matter what, because they are the heroes for the generations coming up the ranks. So when I talk to, let's say, a woman around my age that has said, I'm done, it's over, it's too late for me. I'm giving up on my dream. They'll give up on themselves so easily. But what I have to keep reminding them is, but here's the thing. You have some young adults that are still looking to you to be their hero because they're not getting heroes out there, right? They're looking to you. So I want to keep talking to the adults, but I have to tell you, honestly, the legacy that I want to leave, and this is really the truth, is I really believe that we need to totally revamp how we are raising up young humans right now. And I said this to you, I think, before we started that literally I'd like to take five-year-olds and teach them the ice cream cone thing. 
because it is much more important for them to realize that they matter, that they have a very specific God-given purpose they were sent here to do and to follow that out. Because if they follow it out and they stick to it, everything else will be right in their world. And they'll know exactly what kind of education they need to have or not to have, right? I don't need to learn Excel because it's not my gifting. We try and teach people things they don't really need to know. And that's the problem with our system is we need to really teach them who they are and raise them up to be mentally healthy. I think this is a big reason, problem we have right now with um, mental instability. It's not so much the disease, it's what we've trained people up to believe that they aren't who they really are. And that's a problem. So that's the legacy I hope to leave is that we change some generational breakdowns that we've had and we start raising up some new generations that are following their purpose. Well, Carrie, I can genuinely say as someone that is part of that younger generation, you, even through this, this short period that we've been talking, you've helped me so much and I can't thank you so much for being here. Yeah, um, and there's no doubt that you're going to leave that legacy behind in my mind and big, a big fan of yours, big advocate. And just, I just thank you so much for being here with us to share your message. No, well, thank you. You have no idea. Such an honor. Thank you guys so much for listening to yet another episode of the One Life Podcast. I hope that you were able to take one or two of these ideas that we discussed today and are able to implement them in your life to make you more successful in whatever it is that you're chasing. Remember, only one life to live, no time to wait, act now. See you guys on the next episode of the One Life Podcast.